All right, folks. Well, you know you're in for a treat when you hear that tune. It's time for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast. This is the Chats edition, but we also have a forums edition every week just talking poker strategy. Uh, I'm your host for both. I've got the best freaking job in the world, talking poker with my friends here on the podcast every Monday night, 730 Eastern, live on YouTube. And you can join us every week for free and win a prize just for showing up. Uh, my name is Jim Reed. I'm Bluff Starini in the home game and at Rec Poker Jim on the Hellscape we call Twitter. And uh, we're going to be talking to Veronica Brill in just a moment. That's right, folks. She's back. Uh, but first, I'm pleased to mention that we are uh, brought to you by Running Aces. They're the official sponsor of the Rec Poker Podcast. You can find out more about them at runaces.com. Most of what we do here is free. We're a largely volunteer-based organization, so we really depend on support from our sponsors and also from our premium members who uh, chip in their 22 bucks a month to take part in our training material and study opportunities. And uh, I want to shout out a couple folks uh, recently, Julie Keen. Thanks, Julie, for uh, signing up for our premium membership. And then uh, we've launched our Patreon uh, platform as well. So if folks want to buy us a cup of coffee there for $3 a month, we really appreciate that support. Um, or they can pay $10 a month and get audio versions of almost all our training videos downloaded right to their phone, like a premium podcast every month. So I want to thank Joe Walton and Rob Brereton uh, for being fantastic supporters over on Patreon. And if folks want some other ways to help us out, you know, a lot of them doesn't cost a dime, but we need a lot of help uh, all over the board. So head to rec.poker slash support, and you can find out all sorts of ways to uh, help out our mission here to make the recreational poker world a better place. Uh, most of what we do here is free, so uh, you can sign up for a free account at Rec Poker. All it takes is an email address and a smile, although we do insist on both. Um, but you can always get your first uh, month of premium membership for only $5 by using the code Rec Poker at checkout. And if 5 bucks seems like too much, I get it, man. Let's, uh, let's do a little deal here. We love supporting local food banks here at Rec Poker. So if you uh, make a donation of any amount, to a local food bank and just send us the receipt, we'll happily credit you a free month of membership here at Rec Poker as a way of saying thanks for uh, for doing some good in your own backyard. Now, um, speaking of your own backyard, they get uh, you get used to hearing my voice on Mondays because uh, they let me host the show, these suckers. Uh, but I'm only one man. It takes a group, a gang, a village, a crew to make all the magic happen here at Rec Poker. We call our group of wizards the Wrecking Crew. And if you want to find out more about me or the rest of the crew, you can go to rec.poker slash crew. But you can just listen up because you're going to meet a few of them right here tonight on the air, starting with producing co-host Chris Jones. Well, I'm Chris Jones. You can find me 5b5 on Twitter or 5 by 5 in the Poker Stars home game. And I help run our monthly strategy segment called The Deep Dive. And I'm John Somsky, also known as Poker Geek MN Everywhere. And I help coordinate our home games. And I'm Kim Kilroy. I'm Pat, Pat, Pat Vet 33 on the social platforms and Fergie 56 in the home game. I run a hand history review group once a month on the second Wednesday. And I want to give a special shout out to Julie Keene. She's part of my Pocket Queen study group. And I'm really excited that she's a premium member now. Oh, fantastic. Well, thanks, Kim, for spreading the good word. However, people hear about the great stuff we're doing here. I'm glad they get involved. So thank you to you. And thank you again to uh, Julie Keene. And thank you to Veronica Brill. Veronica, no stranger to the show. Uh, we got a chance to chat uh, the other day and um, we said, let's let's reconnect, old friend. Um, first of all, I just want to say thanks for coming back on the Rec Boker podcast. Thanks for having me. I don't know if you saw my jazz hands going crazy to that intro music but i'm feeling it i'm happy to be here <laughs> that's so great we do have a good time kind of getting into it with the music that's peter trulin gotta shout the guy out if you want to work with peter he's a gem uh his email information is in the show notes uh so yeah thanks for bopping along with us because you know sometimes you get that infectious beat and it's just like what there's nothing you can do um, it was hitting it was hitting it was in the, yeah it was great it was yeah. hitting <laughs> So, uh, Veronica, I, you've always been uh, a good mix of sort of this sort of like a, an industry professional, but like a, 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 a recreational player. And I mean that in a in the way of not playing for a living, but enjoying the game, loving the game, profiting from it. Um, why don't you so you've worn a lot of hats uh, over the years. You've been a commentary uh, expert. You've run shows. You've done promotional work. Of course, you've also really enjoy just playing poker uh, all over the United States of America and beyond. If uh, if our audience doesn't know who this Veronica Brill character is, I don't know how that's possible, but uh, how would you describe your current role in the poker world and kind of what what's going on in your life right now? Because I know there's been there's been some stuff happening lately. 
Yeah, I don't have a current role. Uh, I might be, you know, helping out Valley's doing some stuff with the ladies cash games that they're trying to put together on a monthly basis. But I, uh, I have just exited. I was hoping to exit the world of poker media. Um, I did just exit from, you know, the Nick Vertucci show. And um, I probably won't be doing any more host hosting on Hustler Casino Live um, until I know that situation has been properly uh, dealt with. And um, so we're going to open up our uh, our YouTube chatters here. If you've got questions for Veronica, feel free to type them into the YouTube chat and we'll make sure that uh, we ask them over. And if you're on the Reckon Crew panel here, uh, just unmute. I know there's a lot of interesting subjects that we could talk uh, to Veronica about. Um, oh, and I guess before we get really into it, also, if you're in the YouTube chat and you've got some suggestions for stake study stack, type those in and uh, give a, give Chris Jones some ammunition to put Veronica in the blender later. And of course, anyone who wants to help support our fight against food insecurity by supporting a local food bank, if you make any um, donations to our show via the YouTube super chats or super comments or whatever like that, we'll share a portion of all those donations with a local food bank. Um, all right. So, Veronica, you, you, you sort of led right into it there. There is. I'll, I'll just kind of sum up. And you can tell me what I'm what I'm missing here. But you were very involved in uh, like the Nick Fertucci show, the podcast. Uh, Nick had a place in the poker world as sort of like helping to run the Hustler Casino Live. He's stream. the owner. He's he's one of the owners. Him and Ryan um, own Hustler Casino Live. OK. And there have been a lot of credible allegations over the last while that uh, Nick has been behaving inappropriately, specifically with women. Um, I'm I'm very removed from the situation. I only know what I'm reading in, in headlines and in articles and that sort of thing. Um, I don't want to misstate anything. You, you've been much more connected to it, of course, through your employment with the organization. Um, and then also with your role of just sort of like having to respond to this stuff as it's coming out. Um, would you mind just sort of sharing sort of in your words what what you feel like is the the situation and, and what we're dealing with now on the other side of it as we react and respond? Yeah, I think um, this stemmed from Julia from Palmdale putting out her tweets about Nick's text messages with her. And um, it uncovered um, a deeper issue uh, regarding Lauren, who was one of the star dealers on Hustler Casino Live, um, and allegations of um, it, like I, I don't want to call it something that it may that is it is or isn't. I don't know what the correct legal term for it is. That's like between the lawyers, and I don't know if there's going to be criminal charges or anything. But like uh, sexual assault allegations, I guess we could say. Um, I'm. I wasn't there for any of it, so I I didn't witness it. I do believe what Lauren has told me. So it started out with Julia. And then other women started posting um, their interactions with Nick. Um, you know, things that made them uncomfortable, inappropriate things that he said to them. And um, I guess at the time, the time that I found out that there was something going on with Lauren was the week before everyone started finding out. And all I knew was that there was a dealer who was um, disgruntled, is what I was told. And so if, if we can backtrack a little bit, if anyone does know Nick, he does like to get in the thick of things. He loves to be very dramatic. He loves to fight with anybody and everybody online. If there's a Twitter follower with three, there's a Twitter person with three followers, Nick will argue with with them for a week straight you know um he really is kind of immature in that way where he just is constantly in a fight with someone and so i have gotten to a point in order to maintain my mental health is like not diving into everything he tells me when he's in a fight and so what he told me about lauren was that there was like a disagreement uh, over a tip, a large tip that was given during the Legends of the Felt game. And it sounded reasonable because there was another dealer who received a large tip. And apparently Lauren was disgruntled about it and had lodged a complaint. And that's what he told me. 
So I was like, okay, Nick's dealing with another issue. Sounded reasonable. Didn't say anything about anything else. And I was at his house when uh, Julia's tweets came out. And I asked him, you know, hey, like, look, we're all adults. Um, is there history between you two? Like, is there a flirtatious history? Did you guys have a relationship? Is there something going on? Like, is is this just like out of context uh, for your relationship? Or is this like right square where you guys were a year ago? And he said, oh, we were always flirty. We've always you know, had a flirty reaction. I said, okay, interaction. So I said, where are the other flirty text messages? Do you have any others? He said, no, it was just over the phone. I'm like, well, then just own it. You know, tell people like, hey, Julia and I, unfortunately, do not have a relationship anymore. But when we did, we were flirtatious. And then that probably wasn't the case, right? And then I find out that um, Julia was apparently, from her perspective, removed from the game. Um, he removed her from the game. And uh, it might have been because she refused to deal with his advances. I'm not sure. Um, Julie and I actually hung out last week in the game, but we didn't talk about it. Um, and so I at first gave him the benefit of the doubt when Julia's tweets came out. And then when I came home that weekend, after I saw, I heard Ash talk on Poker Spaces. I heard um, Ellie um speak about her interactions with him which i thought they were friends like i had no idea i actually spoke with ellie after and i said you know i'm so sorry i had no idea that this happened to you i thought you guys were good she's like yeah i didn't tell anyone um yeah when the, all that stuff started coming out i text him i said at, at some point you're no longer the victim of like a disgruntled dealer you are now this predator like you are in the wrong and all their stories are starting to sound the same and so I can't like, I can't support you. And I remember he was asking me, he said, this is, this is going to be a time where I figure out who my friends are and I really need your support here. And I said to him, like, if you want my support, I need the truth. And I think Nick towards me and probably people around him who he thinks are close will manipulate a situation or a story to make himself look like he is coming out rosy and he uh, lies based on omission and he doesn't give you the full story and so I basically told him I can't support you in this and I blocked him um and then I kind of didn't know what to do uh for a few days I was just gathering my thoughts talking to I spoke with Laura and I spoke with Ash I spoke with um some other women and I then I did the I did the poker org interview because I, I just thought like, if I put out one tweet, they're just going to drag me. They're not going to hear the st whole story. They won't understand, you know, the whole timeline of this. Um, yeah. And that's just basically where it's been from there. I'm not quite sure what's happening. The last time I spoke with Lauren was almost a week ago. Um, I'm not quite sure. It sounded like she just really wanted her job back. Um, it is like an, you know, she loved that job. I think she just wanted Nick not to violate her in any way. Um, so I'm not quite sure what's happening with that. And I, I think I'm curious if you feel, and first of all, like, thank you for just being frank with us and sharing all this information again. Like, we don't we don't know what the facts are on, on this side. We're very removed from it. Um, but you know, you and I have spoken several times. I feel like you have a lot of integrity and, and high character when it comes to this kind of stuff. So I appreciate, um, sharing this with us. The, do you feel like you're in a unique position being an outspoken woman poker celebrity who's kind of in this position? And, and I think some people rightly or wrongly like some people say that you've you know added some legitimacy to his platform by like working with him like do you feel tell, tell us a little bit what like what this experience is like for you because i feel like you have a a role like, like a <laughs> sorry what am i trying to say not a, you're in this predicament as well obviously in a very different element of it but what's this like for you it's incredibly uncomfortable and i don't like it i feel like I um, 
like in a way I, I can't be held accountable for his actions especially when like this year I've been in in town four times and I I go to I go to LA once once every six weeks or once every two months last year we'll record like four or five episodes I literally fly in Saturday morning we record four or five episodes I leave Sunday afternoon so I didn't like spend a ton of time with him even though I was his co-host but it is incredibly frustrating given that so many people told me not to work with him mm. and I selfishly I selfishly continue to work with him because one um like I put in boundaries pretty early on with him and he respected those I've never seen him act aggressive towards a woman but just as as far as just me and him um we did end up developing a friendship and I became close with his family, his children, his wife, his cousins, and he has an incredible family. And I just thought, okay, this guy's like really rough around the edges, but there's no way we have this like entire group of people surrounding this man. And he has, he's like a monster. He's not, he's like, he's a really good father. I can't say he's not, he's an incredible father. Um, So it was, it was like a part of me I enjoyed doing Hustler Casino Live uh, hosting. I really just wanted to be a part of the poker community still and do a podcast. And he had he had the money for a studio. He had connections with guests because he was hosting these million dollar cash games. And we had all these like really high profile players came on the podcast. And so I really wanted to be a part of that. He also never uh, told me what to say. He never edited anything out that, he didn't want to talk about you know like he was he was really good with all that um the million dollar cash game i got paid very well for you know i i just enjoyed that part so like part of it was selfishly me but um on the other end like i knew that he was flirty and i knew that he like i don't think he understands he's like almost a 60 year old man and like when you say things to a 25 year old, like they're not interested in you mm -hmm. unless potentially some of them maybe want something from you, but they're not interested in you in that way. And I think he just doesn't see that. And, um, but he, you've never seen him do some of the things that the women have accused him of doing, but I've never been in a situation like most of the time I'm hanging out with him. If I am outside of recording the podcast, I'm hanging out with his family. And so that was a different situation or we would go play like five ten and just be at the poker table the entire time. So I didn't see any of this. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, is that the answer to your question? Oh, yeah. It's incredible. No, I... It's like embarrassing in a way it's incredibly like, obviously I made choices that were self-centered over, over like potentially my reputation because my reputation's a little bit, fucked right now like i'm getting constantly attacked for this um which is like it's fine it is what it is i i also know like i can't be held responsible for what he did especially when i wasn't around so yeah and you were very frank and i encourage folks if you're interested in this to check out the interview uh, with uh, craig tapscott over at, at poker org um i appreciated your perspective on that as well and, and your frankness and you said you you sort of commented in that that you felt like you'd you know selfishly chosen to work with him because it was good for your profile in the industry and like to, to have this place in the poker world i'd push back on that a little bit like you can you can call it selfish like i think we're all trying to advantage ourselves in our industries and like we want to take opportunities that work for us and that like have upside for us every industry is going to have their scumbags and and douches in them um is there a i don't know like Obviously, you know, you would say that if you knew now, you wouldn't go in working with them. But like you said yourself, you know, I I've never met Nick Bertucci, but what I've seen him on TV, like I get the sense like, oh, that guy, you know, sorry, Nick, from the outside, that guy might be a douchebag. Um, when you're sort of getting to know him a little better and, and starting to work with him, like in retrospect, like were there red flags that you feel like you just glossed over or is it just like we're going to work with douches sometimes and like how do we work, oh. how do we get around that? 
I will tell you, Jim, if I were to not be around a 50 something, 60 something year old dude that was a little bit creepy and saying flirtatious shit, I wouldn't be anywhere. Right. Because there's just a lot of versions of him out there in different on different ends of the spectrum. Um, I that is one thing I learned when I first started playing poker in my 20s and like I'm 47. So this was a long time ago. I was just some I mean, I've been made to cry at the table and I had to walk out of the poker room because the guys made me cry because the shit they were saying to me. And like I've had guys say incredibly misogynist things. I had a guy like grab my ass in the poker room. And the guy was married, like, and he was doing it to a lot of women. And this was in Edmonton in Canada. So like, I grew up in like a really, like, I just feel like the young generation is, is getting it right. They are a lot less misogynist and they are, um, they don't look at women as objects, but I feel like it's not an excuse, but a lot of men Nick's age are like him. And to me, once I like, nipped it in the bud i told him like hey if we're gonna work together you can't talk to me like that like you can't this is not it um then it was done and i thought it, i thought like it was pretty harmless to be honest with you i'm like oh yeah he's like he's got that side to him but uh he didn't do it to me after that initial uh, initial flirting and then i just i didn't think much of it like he complained to me about um, sashimi, that ear thing. And I, I thought in a way that like the way he told me every story, it, I always was like, oh my God, he's like over exaggerating everything. And he's always like fighting with someone. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I tell your story. Okay, cool. Nick. It's like, yeah, I touched her ear. She got mad at me. And I was just like, oh, what? I don't know what he's upset about. Like, I just stopped listening to him at that point. So I never even watched the episode until the clips came out recently. So. Yeah. Well, and I think you make a great point that, you know, there's sexist assholes in every corner of the world. Right. And unfortunately, a lot of those are the ones kind of gatekeeping access to some of these opportunities to become great, to 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 raise your own profile, to like. Right. Take that step and in I the think industry. I think what Nick was missing um, from my interactions with him and like maybe he's not missing it now because i stopped interacting with him after all the women started coming up it felt like he didn't understand the power dynamic that he was mm -hmm. holding the keys to the game or whatever it may be and i never had that power dynamic with him you know because i have a job i didn't depend on him for income it was like a fun thing for me to do but it wasn't like if he i like i would like at the if he said anything that would piss me up i'd be like fuck you nick i'm out and we so many fights and i left the show so many times and then he would like call me be like let's work it out let's learn how to communicate and then you know we try again so i i just think that it sounds like he enjoyed that power dynamic and holding like that may have been like the center of what he enjoyed um uh, like if flirting with women when they're they they rely on you to get in these games or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, now we we talk on this show, uh, I, I'd say quite a bit about sort of the plight of people who don't feel comfortable normally in the poker world, whether that's women or new players or uh, you know uh, minorities or uh, you know folks that um, are just on the outside of some of the sort of like good old boy element of, of what what a lot of people think the poker world is. And I agree with you. I think we're becoming a better group. I think we're becoming a better uh, cohort as a as a whole. Yeah, but, I want to be clear that I don't think every man of that generation is <laughs> like that. But I'm just saying that there's we all know them. There are, you know, percentage of them that are so and even some younger. But yeah, yeah. I just wanted to clarify before everyone gets mad at me. No, and I want I want to push that point a little bit, and I know we're getting some some comments and questions in the YouTube chat here, so we'll get to those in just a second as well. Um, but do you think in your in your experience now, because you've been a, 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 an industry professional in the poker world, and you've also worked outside of the poker world, um, do you think that this is a poker problem or a humankind problem? And then we're just the problem is that poker players are mostly humans, and that's kind of an issue. 
Um, well, I will say that like it's both. Um, part of the problem is that poker is 95% men. Um, and so you have like in corporate America, it's like probably evenly split 50, 50. And so if there's like a percentage of men who are misogynist, there's probably less percentage of them, uh, given the entire population, but within poker, it seems like they're greater numbers. And then if we look at the response, and I'm not sure if you guys go into poker spaces, and they've mostly died, like back in the heyday, you know, Daniel Negrano was in there, like all these huge names, Garrett, you know. Um, but now it's kind of devolved into these um, like really angry men who, you know, 60 to 100 of them on a nightly basis will go into poker spaces and really attack they attacked me for like a week after my interview and everyone used to message me like oh my god i can't believe what they're saying about you in poker spaces and it's like this kind of thing is like the reason why women don't want to come forward this kind of thing is the reason why women don't want to play at the tables and don't feel comfortable because these kinds of men are making us all very uncomfortable and making us like making us uh like accusing us of doing something when when we're not the one they should be blaming. And it's so funny that I got dragged for so long, but none of the men that were involved who see him on a daily basis, who hang out with him, and they know who hang out with him, none of them were were dragged in those poker spaces. It was just me. Uh, I, I don't know why they, they chose me for that week. They'll choose another woman. Um, it, it, I got invites to like do one V ones with them. Like I, it's just like absolutely ridiculous. And then, and then Mike Postle has now feared his <laughs> ugly little, little uh, chunky potato head into those <laughs> poker spaces. And he's in there all the time. So it's, it's funny, but he's making my life miserable and he's never yeah. going to stop. No, I mean, that's Yeah. Uh, do you feel like, so I feel like in the ways that you and I have known each other, you've been someone who is speaking on the side of right, who is trying to sort of point out these inequalities or, you know, crimes like the work you did, uh, shining the light on Mike Fossil. Do you feel like, um, yeah, what am I trying to say here? Like, again, I guess, I, can you speak to sort of your experience as the front person for some of this because like you yeah. are getting a lot of blowback that i think it's just angry anger that needs a target and so you're you're stepping in front of that a little bit can you just speak that yeah so the reason i have not been hurt or killed by mike Postle is because he has a daughter because that man is at this point i think deranged and mentally ill his whole life's focus is to somehow make everyone believe that I am this horrible human. And if everyone believes him, and this is like a based in misogyny because he thinks I'm some blonde with big tits. And because I made this announcement, everyone in the poker community is like, oh my God, Veronica's right. I believe her. And he has made it his life's mission to like try to drag me publicly. And he keeps saying he's going to release stuff and he hasn't. And it's all just a ploy, but like he is so angry and he thinks I ruined his life and he takes no accountability for what he did. And he's made it his focus to just focus on me and me be the reason why he is no is shunned from the community. And he is incredibly angry. And yeah, if he didn't have a daughter, I am 100% convinced he would hurt me or kill me. I'm not joking. Um, He's, and him and his group of friends are chronically attacking me chronically so he he's mad that i got poker after dark after i went public with with the cheating he's not mad at joey ingram joey ingram spent hours and hours mm -hmm. uh going combing through all of the hands and proving that he cheated doug pope went through lots of stuff proved he cheated but i'm the target i was just the whistleblower so it it's and there are other people who came forward 
there is another commentator who came forward and this person doesn't want to talk about it because they see what I've been going through. And this is also a woman mm -hmm. and they don't want to have anything to do with it because they see what I go through. So it's absolute hell. This is, this was probably a bad decision. I was told that I shouldn't have uh, said anything. I should have just never gone back to stones. And in hindsight, I probably should have done that because I don't know if it was worth it because like I have gone through absolute hell. And I think that eventually people would have noticed it probably would have taken another six months. People were complaining. People were going to Justin. But like in this moment, if you had asked me like six months ago, I would have been like, no, it was good that I did it. But like this is never ending hell. There is no justice in this matter. The DOJ completely let me down in this case. And now my life is a living hell because of this man. And the only people who've made money off of this, because Mike Postle stole like $350,000 around that amount. Um, but the lawyers have made a ton of money in all the lawsuits. Mm -hmm. And Mike is just sitting there in his mother's basement, you know, just has nothing but time on his hands. When he's not hanging out with his daughter, he's making my life hell. And that's his goal in life right now. So I don't know. I don't like, I think, I think like, Justice within poker, it doesn't happen. Have we ever seen a cheater go to jail? Have mm. we ever seen any anything happen to anyone? Yeah. Cheaters are in tournaments right now. It's it's frustrating. It's frustrating to watch as someone who cares about the poker community, like, and I'm sure I'm speaking for you and for a lot of listeners here in the show as well. Um, you, you know, in the world itself, uh, people acting right and doing the right thing, you know, often don't find that it's rewarded and it's not fair. And it is, you know, it makes me angry to be honest with you. Uh, but I think we have to continue just for our own sake and like for the sake <laughs> for the children, like we have to keep trying to do the right thing. We have to keep putting ourselves in a position where, you know, we're able to shine a light. Uh, is there, it just breaks my heart that we're in this. Okay. We, as a poker community, actually have a lot of power as individuals to police this community, to curate this community. Like, why do you think the poker world, again, I understand it's a human problem. Humans are assholes and poker players are humans. But like, can't we be more selective about who we choose to invite into this? Is it, Am I just being naive or like, should we do a better job of just ostracizing assholes in the poker world and just trying to like, get on without them or is it just not possible because they have all the money and the power and like i just don't think it's possible and i think there's just too many scumbags like look at mike possible went and played in alabama or mississippi or somewhere and his buddy running the mgm room put a different name down for him yeah i saw that you know yeah and then they they didn't want to hold his money i tried to put a lien on his winnings but it was a long weekend so we couldn't get the lien in and mgm gave him his money like his buddy was just trying to help him like there's just scumbags everywhere, scumbags in high positions. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I don't know what you want me to say. Like, uh, does it, I would be as much as your viewers are probably going to hate me for turning this into a misogynist thing. I'd, I'd love to see if like industries that are mostly women, if like, if there's this sort of injustice and, and, and this type of behavior, or is it like, is it because it's 95% men? I don't know. I don't know. I think that's kind of offensive that I said that, but I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know what the correlation is. I'm sorry, the men who are watching and Chris and John and Jim. <laughs> well, I think, I think a lot of us recognize that, you know, a lot of these bad actors in the poker world are men, whether it's because, you know, men are naturally more <laughs> evil people, or if it's just the per perfect storm of, you know, having fewer good faith actors in the room with them, you know, to kind of keep them in check. I don't know. Uh, John Somsky, you unmuted here, and I know we've got some great uh, comments and questions from YouTube as well. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, um, I do agree with you. I think, on average, women tend to be better than men, just better <laughs> people. Um, although there are exceptions in both directions that, you know, uh, make that, that destroy that average. But anyway, the I also think that we as a society and as a people are are getting better over time. I mean, we're not living back in the same place that we were in the 50s. If you watch 
uh, you know, some of the James Bond movies that came out in the 50s and 60s, incredibly misogynistic. And they're a little bit better today. Not that we're always perfect, not that, but I think we as a society are moving in the right direction. Um, so we just need to wait for people my age and maybe even a little younger to die out. And then, <laughs> then maybe we'll be doing even better yet. But I want you to at least understand that even there is a, I believe, a quiet majority out there that agrees with you. Um, I know it doesn't help in that they are a silent majority and they aren't you know, uh, lending any type of, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, but anyway, it, I just want you to know that there are people who feel for you and are behind you, Veronica, even if you don't hear Thanks, it John. as much as you should. I appreciate that. And I love the fact that we can solve this by everyone dying out. Well, yeah, when in doubt, that's the thing you do. That That's the way science moves on, right? When people who had antiquated ideas die out, that's just that's the right. way things goes. That's right. And we're actually introducing a new program here at Rec Poker where we can selectively advance the dying out of some of these members over others. It's uh, You go to rec.poker slash uh, death panels, and you can find out all about that exciting new venture that uh, John Sompsky is going to be heading up for us here. So again, John, thank you for all your fantastic contributions to Rick Poker over the years. Um, Veronica, we've had some really good comments here in the YouTube chat. Um, you've got some fans and supporters here for sure. Even um, so, uh, <laughs> when you first came on the show, we talked a little bit about being from Edmonton, where my dad's from. And um, I shared the story about my favorite nail polish place up the street here that had a big sign out front that said Polish, I thought, except that it wasn't Polish, it was Polish. But uh, we actually have one of our uh, premium members here, Hubie, wants to know, and I'm going to try my best here, Veronica, Pradra, oh boy, Pazdrawienia, I Kaluski i Ameriskanich, Missouri, Pennsylvania. Anything you got anything from that? Is that did he, is it? I you did a terrible pronunciation. Yes, did, I did, did he say something about noodles? Kluski, Kluski's noodles. Chris, I, Chris, I, believe, I believe I did a Google Translate for you, uh, Jim and Veronica. I think you'll be like devastated by his pronunciation, but um, <laughs> I believe this translated to Veronica greetings and kisses from American Missouri, Pennsylvania. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> He said Kaluski. Kaluski is is uh, noodles. So yeah, really good one there, Jim. I appreciate okay. you. That's if Google Translate should, should, correct. We should cancel the Polish segment from now on. <laughs> we're gonna put. We're gonna start putting that one after the ad break. That seems only fair. Yeah, yeah we're always yeah. trying something new over here. Um, and, but yeah, honestly, just a lot of comments. Um, thanking you for speaking out uh you know commending you for hitting this head on after dealing with the mike fossil thing um uh, a few people agreeing with you about the spaces and uh yeah just for what it's worth a lot of people that want to be you know uh, heard uh commending you and and applauding the the steps that you're taking and i'm i can only hope that as time goes on we are able to kind of turn this around a little bit so that the vitriol of of the kind of knee-jerk reactions is matched and and overcome by the sort of hopefully more long-lasting uh sense of kindness and and righteousness and you know your heart being in the right place for this um i i hope that that happens and I, it's terrible that you're in this position of not feeling like it's a slam dunk. I did the right thing and I'm and I'm glad I did. And, you know, like that, that's that's just a that hurts the soul. It does. You know, I feel I feel that. Yeah. I mean I I think like um someone was tweeting um something I said to Vanessa Cade back in the day when she was working for ACR. And I was like, well, I mean she was she was getting mad at Gigi Poker for hiring Den Bilzerian and I was like, well you kind of mm -hmm. knew of you knew Phil Nagy and you worked for Phil Nagy. Um, and, you know, I think to the point of that, I, as soon as I found out that there was, that this was going on with Nick, I left. Um, and so like, if I had known, like, if he was just 
a, a like someone who's flirty. I mean, like I don't, there's just a lot of people out there who are flirty. There are a lot of mm -hmm. people who have like flirty interactions with, with people they know. Like when I was single, I was flirty with some of my friends, you know? Um, but if uh, I had known there was more than just that, I wouldn't have done it. And once I found out I left. And so it, it's like, it, it, it just, I don't think it's the same thing. Um, and she, Vanessa's entitled to her own opinion, but I just didn't think that that was the same type of thing. Yeah. People kept tagging me in that tweet. And I'm like, well, I mean, I guess if you don't understand like the, the, the dynamicness of that, um, it's fine. But yeah, the second I found out I left. Yeah. So does this, um, does this taint your love of the game of poker? Is it, is it, is there a, a, like a heel turn here happening in your heart for just because it's of all the negative associations now? And it's, I'm, I, I mean, I did say like for the week or two after, like, I'm not doing any more poker media. I just don't want to do it. And even this, this podcast, I wanted to do it because I've, I've, I'm friends with you guys. You guys have always been gracious to me, but I really truly don't want to become the face of this. Like, I don't want to, I declined every, other podcasts besides the interview with poker org um because i didn't i don't want to be the face of this i think this is lauren's fight i think this is what lauren needs to do however she wants to handle it she um i asked her on the phone um multiple times and she's struggling with the thought of um going public with this and telling and sharing her story because She's seen the reaction that I got that other women have received. And she is not as thick skinned as I am. Um, she's very sensitive. She really worries about her reputation and her character. And, you know, working within poker, that's all you you've got. Right. You you're um, on your resume. It's uh, as a dealer. They want to know, you know, do you have a good reputation? And so um it just worries her to come forward because of all of this. Yep. Um, well, we're going to take a little more of your time, uh, Veronica. Last chance to get some questions in in the YouTube chat here. Um, Chris Jones, you unmuted. Why don't you jump in? Yeah, Veronica. I mean, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. I mean, first of all, I mean, a lot of the the chat here today is talking about commending you for the courage and and in terms of your role, both I think um, and you know, sort of immediately um, sort of extricating yourself from that situation as well as we i mean the mike possible situation took a lot of courage as well to sort of come out there but i it, it it does as as jim sort of mentioned it really breaks my heart to think of the blowback being so strong and so sort of like reactive and i think it is a, a form of gatekeeping right like if we can if we can make the people who are sort of sort of you know squeaking the wheel or whatever can if we can make that existence devastatingly hard it's going to make it that much harder for the next person yeah. and i guess what i'm wondering is that's going to exist and there's probably nothing we can do about it there's just going to be people who exist that way and make those things hard but what what can we do to sort of as a sort of a poker community even just as a greater society what do you think are some ways we can make those voices sort of strengthen them, uh, encourage them, make them feel heard. And, you know, I don't think you can feel safe because it's just like, that's just not, that doesn't go with that. But what are ways that we can at least make, make those voices sort of more supported? Um, well, I think one thing is to not support the other spaces, the, the spaces where it's toxic, where people are not supportive. Uh, I've had so many people message me like, oh my God, I can't believe what they're saying about you in spaces. And I'm like, why are you in there? You're just, you're adding to the problem. Why are you in there? If you're in there and quietly listening, you're part of the problem. Um, if you're in there and you go up on the panel and you say, no, this is wrong. Like, what are you guys doing? I disagree with what you're saying. Then, you know, that's helpful, but not everyone has that in them. But yeah, just being a part of those spaces, just because you want to like hear gossip or drama and, you know, you're bored one evening, you're just a part of the problem. Um, and then I think, yeah, I, 
I mean, for me, it's like about wanting wanting women to be a part of poker and then wanting women to be comfortable with coming up with these kinds of things. And so actively not supporting people who attack women uh, for, you know, speaking up if they're uncomfortable at the table or, you know, if a woman is is being talked to in a creepy way at a table, like ask her, like, are you OK? Do you want me to say something like I I just think like just from a woman's perspective and then as yeah, just the negativity. I think like as a community, we've mo and I'm like right now focusing on the negative, but like as a community, like we've seen like Dan and Agrano and like all these big names not join in on in these spaces anymore because it is kind of a shit show. Um, but just like not being a part of groups that don't that are like not supportive and that are negative. Like I'm not really quite sure. It's poker such a big community and it spans so wide that it feels like the best people in poker have um, gotten voices and like the most positive people. But there's still a lot of prominent negativity, prominent people being very negative in it. So I like I'm not sure if you have a recommendation, Chris. <laughs> yeah chris solve solve the problems of the world for us here we can't put all this pressure on our guests you know we, we gotta see, take some of this in like, we see like um gg poker like i think they just struck a deal with hustler casino live like they don't care no one cares right. like if you look at where the incentives are the incentives aren't like oh well we want to maintain you know the integrity or in our name and our brand no they don't care the incentives are with the money the incentives are you know with you know, whatever they are for a business or a person. But like, I think, unfortunately, not everyone, but a lot of people will prioritize money over over ethics. Yeah. Uh, and again, it's like a tough problem to solve when it's when it's a human problem. But we can we can shine a light on it and and make bad actors uncomfortable. Over it. Uh, Kim Kilroy, you had something here. Yeah, it's, it seems to me that it's taken the poker world a long time to catch up to what's appropriate and not appropriate. As, even as recently as two years ago, when I was at PCA, PCA or I'm not sure it was, P, whatever the one was at Bahamar, um, and there was a woman there at the table complaining repeatedly about the language from two guys at the table who were making all kinds of inappropriate sexual remarks and misogynistic remarks and complain. And instead of the floor doing anything about it, they just moved her to another table. Mm. Like, and this is in a tournament, like let's stop the behavior instead of the old boys will be boys and, you know, and let it, and sweep it under the rug. Like we've got to get on the, um, the floor at the and the tournament directors and the uh, poker room managers to actually stop this um, where it starts and not just move people because they're uncomfortable in the position and putting the onus on the woman instead of putting it on the man or the men that are causing the problem. Yeah, I I 100% agree with that. I can't say from firsthand experience, uh, not this past year, but the year before. I played at a PLO uh, series event and uh, I will say like m most of the time, 90% of the guys are awesome. And I, and uh, like, it's never uncomfortable and they're usually cool if I miss mess something up or something. But uh, there was a guy on my right who was very misogynist, very rude and very aggressive that had very incel type of behaviors. And he was calling me names like derogatory names. And I called the floor over and the floor basically treated it like we were two bickering kids. And they're like, OK, you two get along. I don't want to be called back here because I'll put both of you on a timeout. And I'm like, are you crazy? And he was he was loving it. He was like and the, and the rest of the table was like, dude, like, what are you doing? And but nothing, nothing happened. Nothing was done. It was like you two kids calm down kind of that's how I was treated um so yeah I mean if the floor were to do something um then that would be better which is why uh WPT is coming up the win and encore in December and that is a place that I 
have really, I, I, that's my favorite room to play in because they, the second I tell them something, they take care of it. And I, I would love for all of us to uh, kind of be that level where, you know, w we believe women when they say they're being bothered at a poker table. And usually we're so used to it, men. We are so used to this type of behavior that the only time we're going to say something is if it's really bad. Because a lot of times we just like let stuff fly and we're like, ha ha, yeah, okay, buddy. And then we'll just try to ignore it. But we're only going to say it if it's really bad. So if we are saying it, like, I hope you believe us. <laughs> I appreciate that point. Ma Kim? Maybe we should start saying it when it's not really bad, when it's just starting. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to start nipping it in the bud and saying, you know, that's not appropriate. When it's, I mean, being from an older generation myself, I've faced this. This was common everywhere I went and every place that, and so it was the norm for me. And it's been difficult for me to change, to understand that it's not appropriate mm -hmm. and yeah. see how uncomfortable, especially younger women are in these situations. And so I've had to make an about face myself. And I'm not even one of the ones that's like doling out all the abusive um, terminology and actions. So uh, maybe it's time for us not to, to have such a high tolerance, because I had mm, a really yeah. high tolerance. Maybe it's time for us to have a low tolerance for this kind of behavior. So Kim, I 100% agree with you. And I think that's like of our generation of women, older women, we had to maneuver, learn how to maneuver through life with this type of behavior. I was 13 when middle-aged men started hitting on me. And so I had to learn to be nice so that I wouldn't be in danger. Like I had to be like, like be polite, turning down a man who was aggressively hitting on me. Um, and throughout my life, I had to maneuver through these kinds of situations. And I wasn't always given an opportunity to just be like, excuse me, this man is sexually harassing me. Like, it just isn't always like that. And like you said, Kim, you're right. Like, when I speak to 25 year old women, their threshold is like so much lower. And I'm like, oh, my God, like, when I was younger, you should see the shit that men would say to me. And it wasn't right. It doesn't mean it's right. But like, yeah, we had a lot more, we put up with a lot more crap back in the day. So it's been hard for me too to adjust to newer standards, to not tolerate crap. But then like, I also don't want men, I have a lot of male friends that uh, I see and I hug them and I don't want them to feel uncomfortable talking to me. But like men just have to understand that like, you have to have like consent in flirting. Like a woman will let you know, you have to have consent with hugs, like she will let you know that she doesn't want to hug you. <laughs> like she'll be very on, she'll, she'll show you the body language. So um, yeah, it's, that is a very interesting point that you brought up, Kim. And I have seen more men at the table um, say things like, that's not cool, dude. Like, but it's really hard for them to break out of the bro club, in my opinion. It's really hard for men to say anything. Yeah, and then think about if the guy owns the poker show right. and then you want to play in that game, right? Yeah, yeah. Especially Near impossible. Those... Yeah. Uh, John Somsky, you and unmuted for a second. Did you want to um, add anything at this point? No, I think what I was going to say has been in breath. Okay. Um, yeah, so I really appreciate that. And I think it sounds like, you know, the one thing every time the subject comes up, it sounds like the one thing, I don't know if this is the solution, but one thing that would really help is if all the men in the poker world lowered their tolerance for this bullshit, like Kim is saying, and were more vocal in their poker rooms. Talk to the floor staff, people. Talk to the folks that actually have a, a, the power to make and interpret and enforce the rules in these poker rooms. So poker room managers, floor staff, you know, there's a culture in these poker rooms that is permitted and and the those permitting it are the player pool and the people running the rooms so if we want to see a change we need to bring that change into these environments so i don't think it's a silver bullet but i think we all need to do a better job of curating our own community of letting the assholes know that they're not welcome at the table 
and of telling the 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 rooms, the poker rooms, that we have we have a stake in this, and that we don't want to support places that don't treat people equally and with respect, um, whatever that means. Well, For let me can I can I just add a point to that? Like, let me ask you guys, um, what you think about like what if the asshole is the whale? Because I've right. seen whales have there's a different threshold of what they're allowed to do versus what everyone else is. Yeah. Chris, I think that's, that's, in. that's to me, one of the, the biggest issue. I, you know, I see floors and dealers um, just in the spaces I go to. Like if you have a regular who is maybe going to the poker room six or seven days a week and they're pumping tons of money maybe they're a loser maybe they're a winner i don't know but they're pumping tons of money into the place they're tipping well they're the player that uh everybody wants in the game because maybe they're you know they're contributing and they're that's fine but they're an absolute asshole the tolerance for that behavior is so much greater from the whole community from the player pool from the floors from the dealers um and I don't know what you do about that because everyone seems to have an incentive of wanting them in the game. Um, and that's, that's an immense issue that I don't, I don't know how to fix. I mean, I, I know this, maybe this is the naive take of mine, but fuck that guy and fuck everyone like him. And I know plenty of nice people that have money that will play poker. And if we only can, if we can only play six handed because the two of the people at the eight handed table were assholes then get them the fuck out of here. And excuse me, but this gets my blood up because life's too short to spend it with misogynists and assholes. And I don't care as a man or as a woman, like the, the poker room will understand if we make this a priority that we are not going to support places that support these kind of people, you know, they're going to find their own goddamn poker room uh, and play with each other and they can steal each other's uh, money and make each other feel terrible. But like, it's on us. Like we are all responsible for allowing this to happen because we're not making these people feel uncomfortable being jerks in public. And like, you know, I don't have kids, but like I see people behave in the poker rooms. Like if my kid behaved like that, uh, you know, <laughs> there, would, there would be consequences, God damn it. And like, we can't just, we can't just, we are all ambassadors for the game of poker. We are all members of the poker community. The most recreational players, you have a stake in this. And it's on all of us to let the powers that be know that, that it's not acceptable. Or it will just continue to be accepted. Because, like you say, you know, they bring money and they show up and we want them at the table. But, you know, there are a lot of real, real friendly whales out there. I'm one! Like they don't have to, we don't have to just cater to the asshole whales, you know, like there's, there's other people out there. It, uh... Okay. Excuse my profanity. Uh, John, you had something there, I think. Well, I was going to say, people think it's in their self-interest to have the whale that's sitting there losing a lot of money at the table. Uh, and, you know, for that night, that may be true, but I also believe that's a little bit short-sighted because Making poker an inviting game to help grow the game is going to be more sustainable than having some asshole sitting at the table who is paying for the privilege to be an asshole. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I personally believe that in the long term, we're better off making poker a better game for better people. I like that. All right. So solved on to the next world problem. You know, thank you, Veronica. Um, let's let's turn the page on this a bit. I think we've uncovered a lot of uh, good comments here. Got some really good uh, conversation in the YouTube chat. Um, Veronica, you've been very generous with your time. Um, let's let's leave. Let's leave this with a, a, a palate cleanser. So there were a couple of questions. First of all, uh, can you in in your history? Uh, of interviews and commentary and that sort of thing. Is there one uh, favorite interview that you've been a part of? And is there one like strangest interview moment that you can recall? I honestly, uh, so favorite interview. I mean, Poker After Dark really gave me 
access to a lot of like cool people speaking with them, seeing how they play. Um, favorite interview. I think like, I mean, Jennifer Tilly, I just love her. I mean, she followed me on Instagram after like, it's just made my day. She's always so gracious and it's, it's always people like her, like the higher you get, the more gracious you actually have to be. So that was great. But like uh, Landon Tice, he was a friend of mine. He reached out to me to come onto my show when he was like 21, 22. He would call me and ask me like advice about girls and stuff. Um, and I interviewed him on Poker After Dark and and then just seeing his progress. I think that's like one of the coolest things, just watching someone progress through poker and how like they change their life and they they grow up and think differently. Um, and then like Steve Aoki was uh, like, and he was one of those people that, I mean, of course he's a DJ, just the way his personality is, but it, he was like a 12 year old. It was like I was interviewing a 12 year old in like a 40 year old body. And I just remember being like, oh my, I don't even think this guy's real. It was, it was so weird. Um, uh, I think like the best interviews are everybody's just got something cool and unique and you always learn something. Uh, like I thought Doug Polk was a total asshole. He's like one of the nicest guys and one of the most respectful people I've ever met. Like I truly think so highly of that guy. Um, yeah, the, the guys who play million dollar cash games, it's like a different when you speak to them. They very successful people have like different ways of carrying themselves, a different outlook. Uh, it's almost like they have no victim mentality at all. They're like, oh, there's a problem. I'll fix it. Like, let's move on. Um, just they're almost I, I'm not saying this in a mean way, but they're almost too dumb to think about failing. Like, they're just like, oh, it's not a consideration. Like me, all I think about is like, oh my God, my next endeavor, how many different ways am I going to think? And they're like, no, it's fine. Like we're, we're moving on. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's been so awesome. It's like been one of the highlights of my life because I used to watch poker after dark and I used to watch poker on TV relentlessly. And just to be a part of it has been, has been just incredible for me. I'm always just so grateful. I would have done it for free million dollar cash game, but don't tell them that just because it was so. It's just so cool to be a part of. It's such a cool thing to be a part of. Oh, that's great, Donna uh, Dark Angel in in the YouTube chat sees right through you. By the way, she says uh, so nice to see her face light up remembering stuff like this, and it's true. Like you can see the 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 fun that you have, and it's sort of like the love you have for for the game. These things that make the game great. Um, so thank you for that, and uh, uh, thank you for continuing to be this excellent example of uh, an industry professional but a, a recreational player and someone who's uh, got their head on straight and their heart in the right place so it's a, it's always a pleasure to talk to you about this kind of stuff for our really unit thanks jim kim are you drinking wine oh kim love, oh yeah 100 percent got some wine going down there <laughs> no 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 uh, heavens I, no i passed my wine i'm drinking uh out of a wine glass though <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's just rinsing at this point. Is uh, it's yeah, part of her? Yeah, just a palate cleanser at this point. <laughs> uh, Chris Jones, have we gotten the steak study stack suggestions from YouTube that we have? And I, I'm, I'm going, I'm going off the board a little myself. So I've got, I've got some names for you, Veronica. So Veronica, okay. this is a game we call Steak Study Stack. We kind of close off our interview with a couple of games. Um, I'm going to give you three names. You're going to pick one that you would like to stake in a poker tournament, one that you would like to um, study with, and then one that you ha would take great pleasure in just stacking them at the table and taking all of their chips. Mm -hmm. Your three names are, I'm going to make it hard on you, Sean Deeb, Faraz Jaka, and David Tuckman. Faraz, study, Sean Deeb, stack. And then Tuckman, I would stake, yeah. All right. So that, that, that's kind of what I predicted, but I would I wanted to go <laughs> to see where we were going. Yeah. Although, like, Faraz would be cool to, to uh, stack. It's yeah. like, in your face, Faraz. And he would take it probably so graciously. I actually played next to him for eight hours before I became, uh, before I became a member. And uh, I remember him giving, we both busted in the same hand at the same time as a three-way all-in. No, and I remember no. walking to cash together and he gave me feedback on the hand. Most professional poker players are like, oh, you, nothing you could have done. Yeah, it was, it was fine. 
but he actually gave me feedback. He's like, yeah, I don't think it was a great shove. And, and he talked to me why, and he spoke to me like a peer. And I was like, this guy is awesome. And then I started seeing all these women cashing in events because they were students of his. And I'm like, I'm signing up. <laughs> nice. Yeah, uh, we were excited when uh, Faraz Jaka and, and his site uh, joined our Learning with Partners program here. We're proudly sharing his uh, material with our members, along with a lot of our other learning partners. And I'll just put the plug out there if you want to get involved with uh, Faraz Jaka or any of these other fantastic training sites that we work with. You can go to rec.poker slash resources and you'll get a little discount code there to uh, take part. And that helps us out, too. So I hope. Oh, so. that's Thank nice. You. Discount yeah. codes are good. Jaka.com. Yes. Get that discount. I wish I had the discount code. <laughs> That's right. Um, all right. Well, uh, we're going to just close out the interview here. We're closing the action with our speed round. Um, thanks for giving us a little extra time tonight, Veronica. Um, as soon as Veronica leaves, we'll announce some home game results and uh, hand, a, hand out a prize to one of our YouTube audience members. Um, if you want to start typing the words food bank into the YouTube chat right now, that's how you get entered into our raffle. And the reason that we do is we just want to raise some awareness uh, about how hard it is for a lot of people in the world today to put food on the, uh, on the table, whether it's for themselves or for their family, a loved one, a child. I think uh, more people than ever are struggling to put things together. And uh, one big difference you can make in the world today is just by helping out someone in your own neighborhood, someone in your own community. It might be someone who you're surprised to see needs a little help. Um, and if you just pull out your smartphone right now and Google uh, food banks near me, you'll find a fantastic organization that can benefit from either a few dollars out of your pocket, um, a few hours of volunteer work out of your week, or, or some non-perishable food items from your pantry. And so I just encourage everyone to uh, help out a local food bank sometime this week. And um, if you want to enter our raffle, we're going to give away a fantastic prize at the end of the show. And all you have to do is just type the words food bank in there to give me an excuse to say food bank about five times uh, while we get on with the show. All right. So start typing that in there. And thanks for being awesome folks who support uh, your neighbor and your and your partners in uh, our civilized world that need a little help from time to time. All right. Veronica, we call this closing the action. And I'm just going to fire a bunch of rapid fire questions at you. You can say pass. No, no, we're not trying to make anyone too uncomfortable, but I do want the first thing that pops into your head that is 100% true, okay? Okay. All right, we're gonna start with some dramatic ticking noise and then we're gonna jump right into it. Yes, all right. They, oh man, the pressure is on. Okay, we're gonna start with an easy one, Veronica. What is your favorite poker hand? Aces. I told you it was an easy one. Is poker a gamble or a skill game? A uh, skill game. What's your biggest poker pet peeve? Yeah, people who don't pay attention to the blinds and don't push their chips when the dealer is trying to reach for them. <laughs> That's mine too. Um, is Die Hard a Christmas movie? Yes. Is Ace King a drawing hand? Yes. What's one thing that you don't have, but if you did, would make you truly happy? Money. <laughs> is a hot dog a sandwich? Ooh, yes, it is. Okay. If a hot dog's a sandwich, is a taco a sandwich? You know what? Let's go with yes. Okay. We're going to come back to this a little later. Um, should vacations be lazy or busy? Ooh, uh, busy. What's one player you respect and why? Uh, Daniel Negrano. Uh, he's had longevity and he carries himself very well. All right. What about a calzone? Is a calzone a sandwich? Calzone. I'm going to go with yes. Okay. You're very, very uh, sandwich open. You're very open to different sandwich interpretations uh, versus the field. What about a Pop-Tart then? Is a Pop-Tart a sandwich? Uh, Pop-Tart is a piece of garbage. <laughs> we found our line, folks. Um, yellow light coming up. Slow down or speed up? I'll speed up. Uh, you're getting down to the end of a tournament. Are you pro-chop or no-chop? No-chop. No-chop. Uh, doesn't have to be your favorite musical artist, but name one excellent musical artist that you love. Uh, six, six black. Uh, black with a, not, not a B, but a six. Okay. Um, what about an open face sandwich? Is an open face sandwich a sandwich? 
Yes. Yeah, no, yes. you're very sandwich permissive. I, I gotta say, uh, what's one thing you can't live without? Coffee. And who is your poker nemesis? Oh my god, my poker nemesis. Uh, it's it's got to be Sean Deeb. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're right. Okay, that's the end of our speed round. Uh, I've got one more question for you, and then we'll tabulate your points. Um, what's one thing that you do? to make poker more fun for you more fun for me yeah uh okay i think one of the things that makes it fun is having a better understanding of the game because you don't want to go in and just win when you're lucky and lose when you're unlucky right you want to you it's fun to be able to understand what the pros are talking about it's fun to run sims and see like how your intuition could be incorrect, which I'm a big fan of data, using data to make decisions. So um, I think the thing that I've done is um, I've gotten some coaching, some cash game coaching. Uh, I have a ca cash game coach in LA. And then I've been using Faraz's site for tournament, although like I haven't been doing that so much lately, I have to admit, <laughs> but I still have the membership. <laughs> right on. Well, just doing some quick math here. Uh, carry the two. I've got you at eleven hundred and ninety-one points. That's quad quad digits. That's very impressive. That's very impressive, I, Veronica. Not everyone cracks a thousand. So I tend to impress everyone on every podcast. So you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, Veronica Brill, you can catch her as Angry Polak on Twitter. Uh, where where would you like folks to reach out and say, "Hey, Veronica, great show. Thanks for coming on." And is there something that our audience members can do uh, to make your life better in some way, like or subscribe to something or sign up for something or kick someone in the kneecap? What's your preference for how we can someone in the kneecap. Uh, just yeah. stand, stand up for people in poker and it doesn't have to just be women like get the yeah. assholes out of the game. I really like that, Jim. Uh, but yeah, mm. on Twitter, I'm angry underscore Polak, P-O-L-K-A, uh, A-K. <laughs> and then Instagram is the same. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I'm, I'm kind of an old lady now. I don't really <laughs> like big into, into everything. You don't need to subscribe to any of my crap. Like it's fine. Uh, and you, uh, do you, you, can you share anything about this next, uh, project at, with Bally's that you kind of teased at the top of the show? Yeah. So, um, I'm going to be helping them out with, uh, some of the ladies cash games and probably coming out to Bally's like once a month or maybe every other month. Uh, to play their cash games and then we're thinking about putting something else together i can't say it right now but we're gonna we're gonna try a demo of something so god you know what i can't leave i can't leave <laughs> poker media it doesn't seem to be working for me i've tried to retire and become an old lady and you know hang out at home with my with my man but uh it's not working well, I think what you what you really have to do is to make it official next time you're planning to retire, break it here on the show, and then we'll have all sorts of like built in accountability. You know, it'll be like telling all your friends you're quitting smoking and everyone's going to remind you about it every day for the next two months. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get there together. I believe in you. I believe in you, Bronco. Yeah, I mean, it, it lasted for about a day or two. So not yeah. bad. Personal best. Who knew there was such a demand for middle aged blondes? I don't know. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you again. This has been such a pleasure. I hope we get a chance to meet up in person again sometime soon. Uh, we're going to continue on with the show, give away some prizes, and talk about uh, some home game results and some other upcoming events. Um, but thanks again for your time and, and for your yeah. uh, your insights. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for letting me come on your show. It's a pleasure, as always. Really appreciate all of you and your time, because it's also you know the kind of you to listen to me. So thanks, Kim. Thanks, John. Thanks, Chris. Thank thanks, Jim. All right, there she is, Veronica Brill, everyone. Go check her out, angry underscore Polak. Um, now, let us get off to the last steps of the show here. Um, John Somsky, why don't you share some recent home game winners, and then we will draw a prize and see who is going to be our prize winner for the night. Well, we'll start with our Tournament of Champions. Evil Roy CA, David Westerveld, got his second daily TOC of the year so he uh now that only earns him one silver pin for the year mm -hmm. you can only get one silver pin for that category but still a very impressive uh victory on october 14th 
aces, 5-4-3-2-0. Kathy, Kathy Chang got her fourth nightly victory of the year. And on October 15th, aces, 5-4-3-2-0. Kathy Chang got her fifth nightly victory for the Man, year. E. Anderson, 85. Eric Anderson got his eighth night, nightly victory. Larson's opening, George Borden got his third nightly victory for the year. Nice. Cake Poker Wannabe, Ron Payton got his sixth nightly victory for the Big year so we're seeing lots of repeat winners here and john let's see john let's see got yeah. his first nightly victory for the year he's Jeez. won in other years just this is his first one this yeah year. he's one of the ogs over here and for our uh, mixed practice event poker geek mn john somsky got his third victory <laughs> yes keck geek that would be keck geek senior got his first international victory for the year. Max Chaos 2112. Greg Clem got that his fourth Greg. international victory for the year. And Ship and Flip Breck, Luke O'Driscoll, won the LPP event for the second Ooh. time this year. He can contact info at rec.poker for his free month at Learn Pro Poker. That's right. Very exciting. Oh, well, John, thanks for all the work you do in the, the, uh, home game club dungeon where we force you to live and work uh, you've got a great spirit and we're glad to have your uh, effort all the way around um well i do have a, a game window game. in my office now so i can actually see outside and tell the difference between day and night so <laughs> it's a step up uh, we spoil you um <laughs> everyone if you see john somsky out in the wild uh, buy this guy a drink. He he. We all we all contribute in different ways to what we do here at Rec Poker, but most of it's like talking about poker or helping people with their poker problems. Um, John runs our home game club. He doesn't. <laughs> this is this is the fun part of it coming on the show and talking to people about poker. He's got the real he's got the real job job here at Rec Poker. So uh, hats off to you, buddy. Thank you so much. For well, you know, I don't think in any way, shape, or form I do more work than anyone else. I just probably do more boring work than anyone else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's probably right. <laughs> that's probably right. Well, hats off to you. Um, all right, so we got some other fantastic group of comments in the YouTube chat here, um, including I'm going to include my mom because she's watching along like she always does but she can't type in the chat for some reason she's a boomer and there are technical skill issues you know she's she's not always going to be like logged in properly or you know but she did want to say uh yeah why did we burn our bras anyway there you go so that's i should have gotten to that while veronica was here but i'm right you're right mom we got there's progress to be made like why did you guys even burn all those bras if you were going to not see it all the way through you're leaving us with this whole huge problem now to clean up thanks a lot mom and your whole stinking generation but we're doing our best do you um, always get do you always get private chats during the show that you don't that you're just now sharing with us like i i she sometimes she's she's logged in properly and she can comment in the YouTube comments, chat okay, properly right. that's usually what happens but every once in a while if she can't log in I'll just get a little text message with her <laughs> observations love on it. the show. I love it. I love <laughs> As it. we're going. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, yeah. Thank you to everyone in the YouTube chat here. Let's give away a prize. Um, I think Eric Anderson got the first. Yeah. He, so, nice Eric early. Anderson makes our life very hard by getting in way, way, way uh, <laughs> before the the gun has even, like, been been pulled out. But, uh, but uh, so, Eric Anderson goes first. Okay. And then we've got uh, John Doe. QB, Dark Angel, Ginger, Midwest 1811, Queens of Poker, K Poker Wannabe, and I think that's it. So that's eight, that's, right? I get seven. Do we have to do it again? I, I only got seven there. Seven? Eric Anderson. Let's, oh, God, I hate. Sorry, this is such bad podcasting. Yeah, Eric three, Anderson. Four, uh, that's eight. John Doe was the next one? Yeah. Uh, QB, Dark Angel, Ginger, Midwest, Queen. QB, I, I count eight for sure. Okay, I'm rolling an eight. eight-sider. Okay, the boomer eight over here, the boomer here, <laughs> agrees that there's eight. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, we've got a confirmation on the eight. We're not doing the dice okay, we're rolling away. <laughs> Who's the winner? It's a three. So okay. that's going to be Hubie. Hubie! <laughs> what's uh, three in Polish, Hubie? Yeah, what's, what's winner in I, Polish? Good I'm job. sending you kisses in Polish, Hubie. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> So, uh, Hubie, you're, I think this is your not your first time winning. You've won uh, some some access to some of our fantastic premium uh, member training sites. So, if if folks don't know, if you are a 
um, a new member at Rec Poker, if you're not yet a premium member, if you're just enjoying our free membership, then if you win the podcast giveaway every week, you get a free month at Rec Poker as a premium member. Um, Hubie has already taken the plunge. He's been a premium member for a while. And that so being a member means that he gets to uh, unlock a whole cooler tier of prizes, which is uh, membership to some of our fantastic learning partners. So I've learned better than to list them all here live on the air without a list in front of me. But Hubie, if you send an email to info at rec.poker, you will get a chance to um, get Rob Washam, who gives away all our amazing free prizes, to set you up with a fantastic prize that I know you will enjoy. So thank you to Hubie for his contributions, and thank you to everyone else in YouTube chat. Um, we got some cool new folks in here. We got some really fun uh, feedback, some really nice comments uh, about Veronica, and some nice comments about what we're doing here at Rec Poker as well. So I always appreciate that uh, lovely, um, uh, warm, uh, positive reinforcement of what we're doing. It does help us out a lot. Uh, we love to hear it, and uh, it puts a smile on all of our faces. All right, Chris. John, Kim, anything to add? If you're watching this live as a premium member, you'd be able to join us in about 10 minutes. We're going to go record the next edition, the forums edition of the podcast, where we'll be talking strategy. Feel free to join us for that. We've got some other cool stuff lined up this week. I'll be joining, I'll be joined by Matt Affleck on Wednesday as he coaches me up in our weekly coaching session leading up to uh, a WPT appearance at the win this December, which I'm really looking forward to getting uh, uh, personal coaching from Matt Affleck for 10 or 12 weeks leading up to the WPT. And I am going to be playing in the championship event there for $10,000. Oh, my God. Uh, and I don't have $10,000. So if anyone wants to come along for the ride, I'll, uh, I'll be selling some action for that. And it's going to be a lot of fun. If you're interested, just send me an email, jim at rec.poker. Um, if you're someone who invested in my main event package from earlier this year, congratulations on your savvy investment, by the way. Uh, and you'll be getting an email from me over the next little while as we set that up, because that was a dream come true. And I want to keep that uh, keep that alive. That was such a such a pleasure. So, all right. I got to thank the. I don't I don't have to. I mean, I have to, but it's a pleasure to anyway. I am pleased to thank the Running Aces Hotel Racetrack and Casino for all their support over the years. Uh, what a fantastic guest that was, Veronica Brill. Always enjoyed talking to her. Um, some really wonderful folks in the YouTube uh, chat. Yes, and uh, yes, Midwest 1811. You can buy action in PB&J form. Send that email and we'll get we'll get you all sorted out. We have a, a rich interchange of uh, sandwich futures that we uh, engage with over at the staking page there. So yeah, don't hesitate to get some of that PB&J action. Um, Thank you to all of you for making this show so much more fun than when we used to just do it uh, offline. I love doing these on YouTube and it's uh, life-giving to get this feedback from everyone in the group there. So thank you to all of them. I think that's everybody. We thank everybody. Chris, John, Kim, Running Aces, Veronica, YouTube chatters, you listeners at home. Oh, well, thanks for sticking with us, folks. Have a great week. We'll catch you next week on the Rock Falcon Podcast. All right, take care. We did it. 